Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to somebody who was integral in my own acting growth and who kicked my butt literally, uh, well, almost literally, but it felt like literally. Uh, I am uh, having the pleasure of speaking with uh, a casting director, a writer, and a wonderful human being, Kathy Rankin. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, listen, that's growth uh, in life and in acting is, is a kind of a interesting path. And a lot of times there is some pain involved. And, uh, you know, you were that, uh, that you know, one of those painful moments for me and ended up being a very positive thing. Because when I took, uh, I took a couple of workshops from you, uh, the initial one was at uh, Blue Door, which is a, a very nice uh, uh, place in Chicago that uh, fosters uh, growth of actors. We'll link that uh, below the video. And when we were there, um, I, I kind of walked away feeling very dissatisfied because you saw me for reasons that I couldn't identify until later as guarded and not as open. And there was just something there that you saw yeah. uh, that didn't, uh, didn't, you know, kind of, uh, I didn't sit with well. Uh, because I view myself as this open uh, person, you know, open book, you can ask me anything, I'm very self-aware, and then you saw something, and I kept fighting against it. So do you remember uh, what was it that you saw? I'd love to uh, find out, and then we'll go into how I solved it afterwards. Yes, I do remember what I saw. Um, it feels like you were hiding somehow, like I wasn't getting, uh, you know, my whole I'm sure we're going to talk about my theory of charisma, where you need to be showing at least five different emotions all at the same time to be a, a, a very charismatic person that we're drawn to and we're emo you're emotionally compelling. And I didn't feel like you were emotionally compelling. You feel felt shut off to me. And I didn't know where you were. Like I thought you were hiding or something. So that was my initial sort of uh, intro to you. Um, so. um, and you were right. And I, I couldn't understand it for a little while because you know, when you're in front of, uh, of people and you're kind of uh, being in the center of attention and people are asking you questions and trying to get to kind of the bottom of who you are, there, for whatever reason, I felt like I needed to, in a energetic uh, uh, perspective, I needed to protect myself. But also I felt uh, later and I understood that, you know, as an actor, I was blocked um, and I wasn't uh, kind of Im available emotionally. So... After a couple of workshops with you, I remember saying to you, okay, I'm going to do something about this after the second one. And I went into a place called Black, uh, Black Box uh, Acting. Um, and what they do, it's, it's a theatrical. It's not really for on-camera uh, people. They're, you know, they're basis theater performers, but it's applicable everywhere. Uh, and I'm so glad that I took their kind of the introductory uh, B1 uh, course, which was a kind of a mix of Meisner viewpoints and other stuff cool. thrown in. And I very quickly realized that I was blocked and I was kind of this lockdown trying to analyze everything and determine where things are going. And those three things, you know, Meisner took my focus away from being in here and focus on the person in front of me. Uh, viewpoints took my focus just into my body and out of my head. And um, the whole program just said, you know, be spontaneous. And uh, I'm going to swear at this point, but they love saying it's uh, just fucking go for it. Um, and by the end of it, I was doing scenes. I was coming in with just a specific intention uh, and what I was feeling at the moment. And I was completely... Now uh, open and free to the point where, you know, there was a scene of somebody serving salad and then I saw a cake. So I just went and I grabbed a piece of cake and started stuffing myself with the cake and eating salad at the same time. I would have never in my whole life done that and thought it was appropriate to do in a scene, but that's what it uh, kind of made me change. So thank you so much for forcing me to kind of re-examine who I am uh, as uh, as a person and as an actor, and made me uh, made me get better. So I, I really really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Yeah, I always it always feels like painful for an actor when they're yes. not showing themselves. So I could see your pain, and I mm -hmm. guess I wanted to help that. That's kind of my impetus. And you can't pussyfoot around that. You know, you just have to be very honest. Yeah. Um, 
So, yeah. um, and then uh, kind of it goes into what you do for others, like you've done for uh, for me in that uh, short workshop. Um, I'm reminding of you know what Michelangelo said. Uh, you know, I see an angel in the marble and I carve them till I set them free. Uh, I, you know, that reminds me a lot of you and what you do. You oh, kind wow. of strip away the bullshit and, you know, the preconceived notions and you try to get to who the person actually is. Um, what is your process for doing that? Uh, well, the actual technical process is to interview someone on camera where I ask questions and, and each person gets specific questions about how I'm, it's, it's sort of geared toward what they're giving to me and what I'm seeing and, and what they're expressing. And so uh, every single interview is a totally different animal. Yeah. Uh, and so I do that and then we stop the camera and then I make you watch it. And then it's sort of like, how, how, how many emotions are you showing right now? Yeah. You know, like how how are you even feeling about watching yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it kind of starts from there, and then it becomes almost psychoanalysis. Really, finally, it's like a therapy session, boot camp therapy session. Yeah, because it kind of is right uh, because we we put on all of those layers, and we yeah. put on in you know in my uh, past case, and probably still to a certain extent, you know, protective layer because. Yeah. I'm, an, I'm a very empathic person. And uh, I've noticed, for instance, uh, those who don't understand what empathic is, uh, go to Walmart. You know, go to Walmart and note how you're feeling before going to Walmart and note how you're feeling after going to Walmart for half an hour. And I can tell you that I could be happy, I could be light, I could, uh, you know, uh, sing uh, show tunes, I go to Walmart. After a half an hour, if I don't protect myself before that, I am drained, I am angry, I am frustrated, and it has nothing to do with Walmart. It's just that I kind of absorb a lot of the energies yeah. around me. Yeah. So that's that's a area that I had to learn how to protect myself. But when you're acting, I can do that. I, I just have yeah, to be. Yeah, you have to do I mean, an actor has to be very raw, you know. Uh, and, and you also have to be self-aware. So you have to understand who you are. Because so many of us put up facades. We put up, like, our business facade and, you know, our professional facade and our uh, good friend facade instead of, like, who are we really under all of those layers and uh, it takes work to get there. Yeah, um, and you know, this is how kind of uh, it goes to your work of your it factor. You know, is that what you're trying to do and what you define as charisma is really just your authentic yeah. you know, expression of who you are? Yeah, it's your authentic expression of who you are and it's a combination, it's a balance of dark and light qualities. Because if you're all light qualities, you're going to seem yeah. fake and people aren't going to trust you. And if you're all dark qualities, that's pretty, re that's repellent. So yeah. it's just being a fully dimensional human being, which we are in our real lives, in our real yeah. lives. <laughs> so it's just having a balance of dark and light qualities. That's perfect charisma. Yeah. And how do you, uh, so again, the balance of light and dark. And I remember you giving us uh, worksheets uh, when we were at that, uh, at those workshops. Um, how do you, get away and again this is me being very analytical but i want to get away from it so how does one as an actor get away from saying oh okay i am those five light and i'm too dark and i need to show it here or this is where i'm analyzing my script and that's where that comes in how do you incorporate those qualities but get away from all of the pre-planning and uh, analytics? Yeah. yes you can't pre-plan the basic precept is um you've got a scene right and uh you always have to imagine like what happened before the scene like what's the moment before um and of course what do you want in the scene so anyway so you do those basic precepts and then you also ask yourself how am i feeling at the top of the scene mm -hmm. because of what presumably happens right before the scene and sometimes you have to make that up actually to be honest a lot of times you don't get the full script so you, you basically say how would i feel in this situation talking to the person or the people i'm talking to so you say how would i feel and you come up with five different emotions like three light and two dark and you put yourself into that you take a moment to put yourself into that emotional state okay. so it's not like you're going to be sad on one line or mm -hmm. happy on the next line it's just you put yourself into that emotional state yeah. and then you start the scene yeah, that that works. And uh, going back to kind of, uh, you know, black box uh, where I did that, uh, you know, B1 training uh, before every scene, they said, 
you know, think of something that just happened to you and uh, get into whatever it feels like. Yeah. But make sure that the stakes are high enough so it's palpable. And then walk into the scene with that, regardless of whether the scene has anything to do with it. Right. Uh, um, and I don't know if I, uh, I mean, I usually don't say um, the stake, you know, make sure your stakes are higher. It's just make sure you're feeling it fully is yeah. really more because the only thing that we respond to is emotion in, in an audition, in a self tape, in a movie is we're emotionally moved by something. So you have to deepen your emotions mm -hmm. and, that, and that's the key. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably their vocabulary for, uh, for getting yeah. to that point. Yeah. yeah, it has to be. It has to feel uh, something to you. you know, yeah. I remember, you know, doing a scene in which I was, you know, creating, I think, a, a doll that was a physical exercise. And, you know, in the scene, I had to be creating something for my daughter who uh, uh, passed away. Right. So you kind of it's it's high, uh, high stakes. You have to have something that you're feeling. And whether you choose to use your daughter or not, that's a separate question for a separate technique. Yeah, I don't I don't really believe in that personally. Right. But um, I feel like you, if you put yourself in that situation, you will already be, you know, yeah. conjuring up those emotions. You don't really need to think about, uh, you know, anyone in your life. Uh, I know that's a controversial attitude, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm with you on that because, again, the whole method of you have to utilize your own experiences and uh, draw on them all the time. For me, you know, it works once. It's painful. But then you have to do 50 different takes and all sorts of uh, shots, you know, over and over again. And it's it's not a healthy thing to do. And you don't get to that same level and you can't maintain it. And then yeah. you can snap out of it. It's it's not something that I found that works for me on set. Yeah. And plus, um, what if nothing bad's happened to somebody? What if, you know, you're doing a scene about you've lost your father and you, your father's still alive? And, you know, you, you it's just it's too it's overthinking it, I think. Just put yourself in the emotional state. Also with the whole balance, dark and light, if you play one note, like you're frustrated or you're angry or you're happy, if you just play one note, that's going to be a truly boring scene. And we don't want to be bored. Like casting directors don't want to be bored. <laughs> we want to be moved. Uh, and most of the time we're not. So please help us out. Yeah, because you're seeing, you know, for hours on a day, you're seeing the same you know, uh, seen over and over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, but then uh, when we see someone who's uh, really uh, as showing all the emotions and is really in the situation and really connected with the person they're reading with and we feel it, that's a gift. So it's worth all those hours and hours and hours of looking at boring self tapes or boring in-person auditions. Good. Process of discovery is amazing. I agree. Um, when, when I look, and again, go, going back into kind of uh, acting, when I look at the, you know, I spoke to many actors by this point, and I spoke to acting teachers like, you know, Warner Laughlin, uh, and I speak to casting directors, and I kind of, uh, you know, take everybody's perspective. So I put the acting uh, in three different categories. So tell me if you kind of would agree with it or not. It's okay. either, some people are saying, just be yourself. Uh, some people are saying, be somebody else completely, do not be yourself. And then most people are somewhere in the middle and then they have different methods of getting there. Um, I remember, uh, and correct me on this if I am wrong, I remember in, uh, in one of your workshops, I think you've mentioned that for actors who are doing commercials or even TV, unless it's uh, something very specific, you're really uh, just expected to be yourself. Yeah. Am I wrong in that recollection? Yeah, there's no line. There's no difference uh, okay. with uh, television and um, and commercials. I mean, commercials, it's you in a good mood. <laughs> and you not fake or not slick. So commercials have their own like acting style, really. Uh, yeah. Every genre has a different acting style, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. But for TV, it's basically you in that situation. Unless it's a comedy, and then it's a heightened you. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's you. Um, a film, if you're like the lead of a film, let's say, um, then you might be asked to be somebody totally different and you become a chameleon. But not that many actors can do it. And that's not really where, what you should be going for, unless it's like some tour de force role. You should yeah. just be worried about that. And I think that's where a lot of actors get lost, is because we were kind of 
hearing about all these different methods and we learn all these different methods and then we start really getting into the background and really getting into the character and then we hear from people who are actually working and they're saying stop just be yourself just act. Um, it's really it's more about don't act yeah <laughs> you know because we can tell when you're putting on an act you know, um, I mean, in theater, you can get away with not acting, but yeah. um, but it's more of it's more character work, I would say, but yeah. not really because if you're overacting, that's not good either. So, um, yeah, yeah, there, there's no more, uh, especially you know when you're dealing with uh, with uh, being on screen, it's it's your eyes, and uh, you, you're not there, you can't emote things to the last row because that's not what they're paying attention to. The camera just sees right yeah. here. Yeah, I mean, the thing with theater, there's smaller theaters now, so I don't even know if the whole idea of uh, moting to the back row or even, oh, I'm too big for the camera. I don't believe in stuff like that. I think that each actor has its own their own calibration. You know, so if you've done a lot of stage, some actors uh, do well still on camera um, and others need a recalibration. But I think, because I love working with theater actors that uh, also are now doing film and TV, like that's my forte. And it's really different for each person. There's not a blanket statement of, I'm too big for the camera. That That's wrong way to look at it. Okay, so then circling back to my own kind of, you know, three different buckets, be yourself, be a mix, be somebody else, where would you fall on that? Oh, be yourself, all okay. the way. Uh, just makes things so much easier. I remember one of my best friends, you know, when I started getting into acting, one of my best friends, you know, looked at some of my, uh, you know, best performances and demos and kind of uh, some of the, you know, things that I was putting on tape. And she said, they're good, but I would be interesting, uh, interested in just watching you on screen. You're interesting as a person. Just do that. And that kind of hit me uh, like a ton of bricks of saying, why am I not doing that? Well, it goes against all the whole thing of being somebody else. But yeah, I'm more coming back to what you were saying of just be you. And yeah, I don't know where this whole notion of uh, you have to be somebody else because good acting is really not acting. It's stripping away and getting to the real person. I mean, that it's it's getting rid of pretense. So <laughs> I don't really know where that odd notion of acting came from probably from the 40s or something, I don't know. <laughs> and it also, it also explains why some people who've never acted before, who are just kind of thrown into a position where they have to act and people are saying, oh my God, you're an amazing actor. And maybe it's because they are, and maybe it's because they haven't been taught all of the stupid stuff that they have to let go of in order to actually yeah. act. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because really, we just want natural. It's a natural, natural quality. Um, unless, like I said, if it's a different, if it's a, a, a comedy, it's still got to. It's natural, but it's still it's heightened. It's heightened energy, but it can't be too big. So it's a, it's a fine. Comedy is very, very tough to do well. Yeah, and uh, I actually wanted to ask you about comedy because you know the more the more I talk to people, the more I see that you know as I think Warner Laughlin described comedy. Is, is like a musical, uh, is a piece of music. You know, it has a certain uh, way that it's written and you have to play to that way. So again, coming into me trying to disconnect my head and just uh, be in the moment, um, how do you keep in mind all of the little intricacies of uh, comedy and the timing and the one, two, three, while still just, you know, being yourself? Yeah, the main thing is to be yourself. Now, it's just the different styles are different, you know. I mean, I cut my teeth in casting in um, multi-cam comedies, which yeah. is, you know, the old-fashioned in front of a live audience. Yep. Uh, witty repartee, you have to get it word perfect. There's no improvisation because the timing has to be just right. And those writers who write those, those lines, they've harbored over the sentences and what word comes at the end. And um, it's, it's, it's like doing Noel Coward. You're not going to paraphrase Noel Coward. So mm -hmm. sitcoms are like that. It's where you, you want to be as exact as you can because of the rhythm of those lines. So that's that. But then like a one camera comedy, uh, is is um, you're you're not given 
like scenes in one camera comedies have a lot of inserts. So you really don't get a long scene. You get like one line here and one line there. Um, and they sometimes want you to improv. You just have to know that style um, that, that you're auditioning for. And then there's the comedic film, which is usually over the top, like crazy characters that are mm -hmm. in the world of the film. Usually the leads are kind of normal people. And then they're in this world that's like wacky. So yep. um, sometimes the director wants you to uh, to make it your own, even the words, you know? So you just have to know exactly what style it is, ask the casting director, ask the agent to ask the casting director, you know, just know, know what you're auditioning for. Yeah, and um, you know, where kind of I grew up, I grew up on, you know, Jim Carrey, um, not not him being an amazing actor uh, in- Matt? Uh, uh, huh? The Mask? Yeah, well, The Mask oh. and uh, uh, the uh, uh, Pet Detector, uh, Detector, <laughs> Pet Detective, excuse me, uh, Jim, my apology. Um, so I, I grew up on that. So, you know, to me, acting was just very over the top. And I had so much fun playing a role where I had to be a, you know, um, sexed out, uh, coked out, motivational speaker, ED spokesperson. Uh, that was the most fun because I can just, you know, completely let go and go big and have fun and not think about it. That was a lot of fun, but you can't do that for most of the. <laughs> well, if you're if it's sketch, I mean, if you if you're uh, if it's for SNL or you're doing a sketch comedy show or Living Color, which I think is where Jim Carrey started, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, um, you you can do that, but again, you can't do that for a four camera because yeah. a, a sitcom because that's more of a real world. Like you have to understand the world of the piece that you're auditioning for. Is it a real world or is it a wacky out of line world? And I guess let's, uh, you've, you've done a lot of the defining already, but let's define it for the audience of, you know, uh, single cam, multi cam, you know, four cam kind of uh, uh, that world. Can we spend a few minutes defining so people know where, you know, what they're watching and what to watch for? Uh, well, uh, I'm trying to, oh my gosh, I haven't watched a multicam in so long, I don't even know what the latest one is. Uh, I can tell uh, you the one I was in the audience for, which is uh, A Man With A Plan. Um, okay, uh, all right. So Man With A Plan is a, is a traditional um, for a camera, yes. Um, and so uh, that's like doing a play. You yeah. do it in front of a live audience. Uh, yeah, there's three cameras. I said four camera, but it's it's multi-cam, so it's three cameras, and they get all these different angles, and then they're going to edit it together. But it is the most like doing a play, and the energy is a little brighter. It's like doing a play, and you have to get the words exactly right. Yeah. Uh, one camera is like blackish, or I mean, I worked on Arrested Development um, mm -hmm. many years ago, but it's those are one camera. Parks and Rec is, I mean, there used to be the mockumentary, which I think is not as popular anymore, like The Office, mm -hmm. Parks and Rec, um, and that that's also one camera, to, camera, which it's, you're in a real world. Sometimes it's so real, it's like uncomfortable, you know, like The Office. Um, mm -hmm. Blackish, that's a real family, and they're dealing with real issues. I love that show so much. So, uh, you know, that they're, they're just real people in that situation, and then that's where they have inserts that make it a little funnier. They'll have a voiceover. So there's other elements to it than just the scene work. Good. Uh, so and then there's sketch shows. Uh, uh, astro I mean, there's a lot of different sketch shows now, Astronomy Club. Uh, well, Key and Peel was basically a sketch show, a sketch yep. program. Yep. Um, I watched uh, I watched long uh, long form improv. Uh, middle uh, Middle Stitch and uh, and Schwartz uh, have their uh, have their Netflix uh, program where they recorded a bunch of the. Uh, oh, cool. That's that's a ton of fun. I'm watching that right now, and uh, it's great. You know, I I uh, did some uh, uh, training at Second City, so. I didn't learn long form. Uh, for me, it was all kind of short form, but uh, long form is fun, and I definitely yeah. see myself having fun with it. Yeah, and that takes the skill of just being really good on your feet and really relaxed and and open. I mean, it's it's a it's a great skill. I, I don't think I would do very well as an improv performer because I'd be too worried about what I was going to say. <laughs> you have to be really fearless to do that. Yeah, but uh, I think. So when I was doing uh, short form, 
it's it's almost when we were performing it's it's uh, not a lot of two men or two person scenes it's uh, usually a three or four person scene so for whatever reason i kind of ended up being the straight man in those scenes i was not uh, i was not the funny guy uh, and I was there, kind of the the you know the audience, if you will, or yeah, just uh, that's a, they, you need that role. I mean, right. yeah. So that ended up my role, and I thought, hey, long form would be would be a lot more fun because I have all these characters and all these things that I can do, and it's just two people in that case that I was watching with Middle Stitch uh, Schwartz, um, where they create all of the other characters. So it would give me a lot of freedom to really play around and come up with stuff. So it seems fun. I definitely want yeah. to try it. Um, OK, thank you. Thanks for uh, kind of putting things into perspective. I think it's it's very valuable. And for actors who are uh, auditioning in front of you or, you know, get get a chance to know what is it that you're auditioning for, because it'll give you the level that you need to be at. Yeah. And sometimes you even have to know, is this a drama or a comedy? Sometimes it's not apparent yeah. <laughs> uh, because there is dramedies, which Yep. You know, there's a lot of humor to it, um, sometimes dark humor. Uh, and then for a traditional like drama, like a crime show or a cop show or which I guess there's going to be less cop shows now. But uh, for, for a drama, uh, it's, it's a good tip to find the humor in the scene, because when we're in tragic circumstances, we will find the humor in it because mm -hmm. it's it's too sad, like it's too tragic. So there's always moments of, of humor in it, in the darkness. And I think that's what makes really compelling straight on drama. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of shows now on streaming platforms that are incredibly dark and raw and you have to go to very dark places and we have to believe you. Yeah. And that is, that's tough acting. That's that's Mark Ruffalo level, you know, which I just watched his HBO show. And um, it's so real and so heartbreaking. And that's a whole other level. Yeah. Um, OK, let's uh, let's lighten things up a bit. OK. You, you, you spent uh, just a bit of time, a little tiny bit of time, 191 episodes on, on Frasier. Um, what was that like and what what kind of takeaways uh, did you have from that? Oh, I loved working on that show uh, for many reasons. Uh, it was a great cast and and great writers, uh, fantastic crew, uh, and uh, and of course I got to meet a lot of my idols uh, because you know we brought in a lot of great actors to come and audition, and I it, just I met some of my idols just doing that, and all the theater that I watched for years, I uh, could use that skill now because they loved having theater actors on that show. And so um, I was a four, you know, I, I worked with Jeff Greenberg on that show and uh, we were obsessed with theater. And so I was, you know, a, I, I knew, uh, we both knew, you know, the good stage actors and they really appreciated that, that. A lot of other shows didn't appreciate that. Like we worked on According to Jim as well. According to Jim didn't really care if we brought in theater actors, they were more for the improv actors. So, you know, each, each show has their different um, sort of vibe, but um, I, I it was it was a it was a rarefied experience. I was there eight years, and it feels like a dream now because it was a while ago, and it feels like I never experienced it. It was just uh, some fever dream I had. <laughs> oh, it's a, it's a good dream. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was a. I mean, I really didn't appreciate when I was you know, that I could walk onto the Paramount lot every day for, you know, many years. And I just, I, it got so like habit for me that uh, I, I didn't realize just, you know, when you, when you're not doing it anymore, you just feel really an outsider because yeah. <laughs> I was inside and it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty amazing. And how did it feel? You, you've mentioned that you got to meet some of your idols, but you got to meet them not just on set. You got to meet them and auditioning them. Yeah. So yeah. How, how is it for you? I know how it is uh, for me as an interviewer because there is a part of me that's professional and I know you know what I'm doing. I have my prep and I'm just talking to a person. Uh, the other part of me that wants to come out and saying, oh my God, I'm talking to you know who. I grew up watching you and yeah. you know, 
how do you do that from a casting director perspective? You have to be very balanced about it. Like I just felt like, I mean, they were the old timers that I watched as a kid, like Chad Everett and Shirley Jones are the two I'm thinking of right off the top of my head, but um, Kyle McLaughlin, you know, just all these people that I, um, that I kind of had posters of on my wall as a teenager. And I would have paid a million dollars if I knew as a teenager that I'd be not only meeting them, but I'd be doing scenes with them and helping them book work. So it was, you, I couldn't be too, too excited because then I would seem like a freaky person, you know, like I had to sort of lay back, but inside I was just really, uh, really very, very excited to be here in this situation. <laughs> um, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I find it all very, very interesting. Uh, as I'm doing interviews now, um, you know, I, I uh, last week I uh, called to book an interview because, uh, you know, I grew up watching martial art films and one of the films uh, was uh, Best of the Best. And uh, usually I would, you know, contact the people via social media or I would uh, get in touch with their agent or a publicist or a manager. You know, in this case, on IMDb Pro for, you know, one of the main actors who I grew up idolizing, uh, uh, he just had his, uh, his company on the phone number. And I called the company phone number thinking, hey, I was just going to ask to talk to him, yeah. give him a message. He picks up the phone. Uh, and this, this duality in my mind of, oh, my God, I am speaking yeah. to Ray. And then it's like, okay, dude, be a professional, you know, say what you want to say. So I talked to him, but it's it's a weird thing that we're going through. Um, oh my God, he, I did that a, a bunch of times where I was trying to get a hold of a star and then I got them. Um, who's the lead singer of Kiss? Uh, I got him on the phone and I was like tongued. I was like, oh my God, like, a... <laughs> uh, and I, I worked on a, a, a audio recording of uh, Motherfucker with the Hat and I got to talk with Chris Rock and, you know, Bobby Cannavale. And I, yeah. I was just, I just was so tongue tied. <laughs> it's weird and awesome. And uh, we love doing yeah. it. Um, yeah. What is the kind of uh, last thing on, um, on, on Frasier? Um, what were some of your acting takeaways and things that you took in uh, to help, uh, you know, in your teaching afterwards? What did you see that now you're using? Yeah, um, a lot. Um, and really, I, I, I learned from the master, uh, Jeff Greenberg. He was the casting director on Cheers. And then, um, you know, we worked together on Frasier. But I took a lot. I, I really learned how when you're doing comedy uh, like that, it's very clean. Like, uh, you know, um, you don't add anything. Um, it's it's very simple, but yet deep all at the same time. And I really learned that. And you don't add any us or ums because that changes the rhythm and you don't, you don't put, put your own words at the end because, you know, those were Emmy winning writers. So if you change any of their words and you put like a, like an improv button at the end, they were, they were not happy with you, you know, cause they were thinking, well, I guess the actor thinks we're, they're fun, you know, they're funnier than we are. So, um, so you just have to be very respectful of, of those words. Um, and, and not be, and um, um, serve the words and don't uh, make it all about you. And that's another thing I learned. The scenes are never about you. They're about the other person in the scene with you. It's never about you because then it's very selfish. Um, being a good actor is selfless. Mm -hmm. And really you wanna connect with that other person. And that's, that's the most important thing. It's not about you. Yeah, um, that's, that's the kind of what Meisner taught me. Yeah. Uh, just be be in the eyes and you know uh, of the other person. How does that? Yeah. Uh, everything comes from there. Kind of all yeah. of your emotions and reactions and everything. It's like, yeah, okay, that person uh, is mad at me right now. What am I? What's going on? It's everything. It's just it makes things so much easier. Yeah, Meisner's tough, man. I I just I get to in the moment. I'd probably kill somebody if I took a Meisner class. <laughs> it's it's. Yeah, um, I, I think the other the other phrase that they had was, you know, what uh, what happens on stage stays on stage, and make sure when you walk off, you shake hands and uh, yeah. you know, talk about it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Oh man. Yeah. Um, okay, you you also did. Uh, I think you were a and get, correct me if I'm wrong. You were a casting uh, manager for NBC, uh, dealing with a lot of pilots. 
Uh, yeah, I was, like, I was manager of casting um, during yeah. a pilot season uh, yeah. at NBC. Yeah, and that was the year that The Office and, mm -hmm. um, and Medium and then a bunch of other shows that didn't really make it. <laughs> so yeah. small, little insignificant things. Um, what, yeah. what was that like? You know, or um, I guess to uh, you know, just the fanboy in me wants to know how much input did you have into the uh, uh, Office uh, pilot? I, I oversaw the casting of it. Okay. So I wasn't in the trenches. It was Allison Jones that was in the trenches auditioning all those actors. Uh, mm -hmm. Like when you see, I guess you can go online and watch their audition tapes. And yeah. that was Allison Jones and her team. That was, She was doing that. So I was an overseer, uh, which I, I missed being in the trenches. Like I didn't, like overseeing is not as exciting as being in the trenches because you're actually doing it with the actors. Uh, so my job was basically coming up with lists of people that could fit all of those roles. Uh, mm -hmm. And then and then just checking, like we would get the auditions each day and uh, we'd check in with Allison. And so it was, it was more overseeing. Um, it was the first um, test at a studio and network where we didn't see the actors live. They weren't doing the scenes in front of us. They videotaped uh, everyone because that's kind of the style of the piece and I thought it was really intelligent. Mm -hmm. So, but man, there was just so many people that were thought of for all of those roles and it just turned out to be so magical. Um, that's another thing when you're casting a pilot, you don't get everyone in the room until the first reading. So there's really no chemistry test usually. So it was amazing that a show like Friends had such magic and a show like The Office had such magic because who knew when you got all those people together what it would feel like. So that was interesting. It's amazing. Um, I read, uh, my goodness, her name escapes me at the moment. So uh, uh, Jenna no. Fisher or? Pam, Pam's character. Yeah, Jenna Fisher. Yeah. Jen Thank you. Uh, sorry, Jen. I, I really love your book and, uh, and your work. Uh, I remember in her book, she was talking about kind of that whole process and then, you yeah. know, being, being brought in the room where they kind of figured out, you know, which Jim is going to be, which Pam, and there were a number of uh, people. Um, it's it's an interesting process. Yeah, it's a it's a it's not a great process to be honest, and and it's all happening like there is to be like I don't know sixty pilots being cast, maybe more for all the networks, um, and um, it was just at, some actors were auditioning so many times in a week, and you couldn't prep very well, and it's it's yeah. a it's a it's really not a good process. I'm glad it's wheedling down now. They have less. I mean, now it's like more of an economic thing. Um, and with Jenna Fisher, you know, she was, I mean, I know it's in her book, right, where she was going to, she wasn't getting anywhere and she was going to quit and uh, she was at a low point. And then, I mean, that that audition tape was, was really brilliant because she was told, like, don't be afraid to bore us. And, but in a good way, <laughs> Not like what I said before, and, um, and her simplicity was just really good. So awesome. uh, I think uh, John Krasinski was uh, ready to quit and uh, kind of off. Uh, he actually, well, he wasn't really an actor. I, I mean, he went to college for playwriting. Okay. So I don't think he was ready to quit, but uh, but uh, but he was doing other things. You know, he was writing and such. Uh, and then B.J. Novak wasn't really hired as a series regular to begin with, and neither was Mindy Kaling. Yeah. They came, like after the testing and stuff, they were hired as writers, really. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. See, uh, there are many paths. Uh, you never know which one is going to work. So continue striving. Yeah, and that's why you got to do a lot of different things. Like actors cannot just be auditioning. You have to create right. your content, and you have to be. You have to write your stuff. Like you have to wear many hats now. It's not just. I mean, in the '90s was the easiest for actors. All you had to do was like do plays and then audition. Like you never had to create your own content. But now it's essential. So that that's my new passion for actors. Good, and thank you for uh, for that. We'll we'll make sure that everybody hears it. We'll take a clip so they hear it again. Okay. Um, we've we've come to uh, to what I call the uh, the casting director lightning round, where these are uh, kind of uh, short uh, short answers to uh, to questions that all of the actors want to know. Okay. Um, so, um, how many seconds do you need to see if somebody is moving forward uh, by watching their audition? Ten seconds. Yeah, that's that's what it is. Yep. Thank you. 
uh, preferred self tape background color? Uh, pl white. I know it's controversial answer. I do not like blue and don't have any, I, I just like a white wall. Don't have any creases in your sheet or whatever you're putting up. Good. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that because I've heard all sorts of things from- uh, I know, there's no- Yep. Um, dress for the part or uh, more generic? Dress code. Uh, what's the second thing you said? Dress for the part or uh, just, you know, more generic clothing? Um, like hint at it. Hint at it. Okay. Got yeah. it. Uh, hold sides or uh, off book? Well, uh, in the room, if you have a live audition in a room, you should bring your sides in with you. And if you need to look down, you should. But um, it's best if you don't. But you, you should, you know, bring them in. For self-tapes, you've got to be totally memorized. And you yeah. can't be looking down at all. Yeah, it's just now, a different animal. I found that again. Uh, these these are not sides. These are my questions that I have for uh, uh, for Kathy. But I found that you know I'm off book uh, pretty much all the time because that's the way I like it. But when I've been asked to hold uh, sides, I know I don't need them. But there is something psychological that makes me uh, want to take a look, and I found it to be more of a hindrance than actual help. I understand why people say have them available in case you need to, but for me, I, it just it becomes more of a mental thing of I have it. Okay, yeah. it's crutch. Yeah. So. Well, you have to know what's right for you, and and if just to because some casting directors are really picky about that, just bring them in with you. But I mean, you're right. If you still think it's a crutch, it's going to be hard for you. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. never easy for actors. <laughs> Same. Yeah. We can learn to get over anything. So uh, we'll, we'll yeah, learn to learn anything. really. Um, accent or no accent? No uh, accent. Okay. No accent. Um, that's that for me is probably the hardest uh, thing to get over because when I read a character, uh, in my mind, I kind of start getting an impression of their uh, of their temperament, of their way they talk, of how they walk. You know, the type of. Uh, you know, uh, clothing that they may wear and a dialect uh, sometime comes in where mm, this guy really feels like he's from Boston or this is a uh, this is a New York or this is a Texan or this is somebody from Eastern Europe. And I want to naturally kind of snap into that and do an accent and I have to hold myself from it. Yeah, you do, because didn't we already talk at length about just being yourself? Yep. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, risk or play safe you know we we talked about jenna you know uh, kind of uh, uh you know doing her best of not have to uh come big and just be uh be down but what's what's your uh what's your take on you know take a risk as an actor or just uh you know play it a little safer i i don't think it's either i think you're just in the moment present in emotional state i i don't i don't think it's either I don't like the term risk or bold choices. I do not like that term at all. Um, and sometimes if you tell an actor do nothing, they literally have nothing going on in their eyes. So it's just, again, everyone is different. Uh, okay. You should just be yourself in that situation. That, that's all, that's all you gotta do. Good. Um, one thing that, uh, that actors do in an audition that drives you mad. Not being, prep, not being prepped enough and being in their head. Yeah, makes sense. Um, in terms of, I said, we'll I'll, we'll come back to the uh, to the background color. Um, I have uh, you know well known casting directors that uh, uh, love blue and hate everything else. I have others that hate blue and want gray. Uh, you're the first one so far that said white. So uh, what I am seeing, and I take a lot of workshops and I take uh, I speak to a lot of people, and now with the interview series, I speak to even more. And what I've learned, and I mean this um, as an observation, not as a judgment in any way whatsoever, but the more casting directors I speak to, the more I realize that nobody really knows and uh, all casting directors are just people and they all have their subjectivity and you know, don't worry about it and just go and do your thing and it may work and it may not. Yeah, I mean, the main thing is, is you're acting good in yeah. the end, you know? but don't okay. have wrinkles. Yeah. 
don't have wrinkles and just have a wide background. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, the last the last part. I want to talk about your writing. Uh, you have three books out. One of which I have. So uh, we'll link that here. Uh, How to book hacking jobs 3.0. Um, I have not read uh, all of it yet. I started kind of uh, skimming through it. I got it recently. Um, if aside from the uh, kind of from the obvious of how to book an acting job, you know, what's uh, what are some of the reasons why people should pick up this book? Um, I think it's a different perspective. Uh, it is the concentration really is on what is good acting instead of like, I mean, it, it talks about how to get an agent, how to what to do it, you know, have a good headshot resume. But it's this is more about the inside of you as an actor and how to be a good actor, how to be a healthy actor, um, don't act for the wrong reasons, what is charisma. Um, I also you know, have a lot of stories about uh, dumb things people do in an audition kind of thing, but it's, it's, it's more about uh, the internal life of, a, of, a, of an actor and how to be healthy doing it and how to book more jobs by being relaxed and being yourself and um, you know, not being in your head. Perfect. Yeah, that's uh, that's very important. Now, now I want to read it even more. Um, and I don't know. So it's, it's on my it's on my interview desk. It's going to remain here, and I will be reading it. Um, you've mentioned uh, kind of dumb things that people do in auditions. Uh, my favorite dumb thing that I've heard is somebody uh, brought an actual gun into an audition. Oh yeah. I've seen, oh god. What what well, what is? All, you can't. I mean, that's that's just wrong in a lot of yeah. ways especially now, but even in the nineties, like someone did that. And it's just scary as hell. It really is. So what was the dumbest thing that somebody has done in the, in one of your auditions? Oh gosh. I don't know why the first thing that came into my head was I was in, um, uh, you know, it was a callback for Frasier. So I was with the producer writers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and by the way, casting directors get nervous when we're in those rooms with the top writers. Like we're nervous, so it's the actor's job to make us calm, okay? Because <laughs> we get as nervous as you because everything is riding on how well you do. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I, I was nervous in those rooms, and um, and this one actor, it was like a physical scene, uh, and this one actor actually picked me up and twirled me around within the scene. Okay. The writer, they were just like, "What the what?" Like that's verboten. Like don't touch the other person in the scene, don't touch the casting directors, don't pick them up. I mean, the writers were actually kind of worried for me. So that was that was probably the dumbest thing. Okay. Uh, uh, also, other dumb things are when actors come in and go, so what are you looking for? <laughs> or, well, I've, yeah. I've planned it two different ways. Which, which you know, way which way would you like to see? Just, it's like, we're just going, just do it. like. It's it's such a weird process, and uh, you know the actors want to show that they're prepared, and they want to uh, ingratiate themselves to the casting director. The casting director has seen fifty of them today. Just do the freaking thing, and uh, if you like it, we'll again, it comes. To, don't put extra attention on yourself. Just a good actor is a good human being. They're not desperate. They they don't want to try too hard. They're just a good person coming in and sharing the words. You know, we're having a conversation within the scene. Like, don't try to make it a bigger deal. It's like, oh. I got you. Uh, one question that I forgot to ask you during the lightning round that, you know, I see now looking at my list is uh, now that a lot of the auditioning is done uh, virtually and it's done in a similar environment to what you and I are doing right now. Um, where do the eyes uh, of the actor uh, um, or where should they be? Uh, because you know, it, we were taught not to look at the camera unless you're doing a, you know, spokesperson spot. Uh, you can't really look down because then your eyes are not present. Yeah. Where would yeah. those be? Well, first of all, self-tapes, you know, those aren't live. So right. when you send us a self-tape, mm -hmm. your eye line should be uh, just off to the left or the right, just off to the side of the camera. Yep. So it's not at the camera, it's at the person you're reading with, but the person you're reading with should just be right off to the side, just a little, there almost is an overlap. Yeah. And then when you're doing a Zoom callback, I mean, that's just a mess really, because you can't be looking at the camera because then you're not really connecting with the actor, but yep. 
you have to be looking at the camera. But, and even if you're looking at the camera and there is a reader, you know, on the other side, like you in this particular case, I'm not looking in your eyes right now. I'm looking at the camera. If here's what my eyes would look like if I actually look to you and try to connect with you so I could get off of that, you know, this is me looking at you. You know, looking at the screen, does that uh, show, you know, do you get a chance to really see my eyes? Uh, I, it, the, the jury's still out for me on that. Yeah. It depends on if the video is going to be sent to a producer that probably you should be looking at the camera because if someone else is going to watch that callback, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's not like if there's a producer that's also watching it at the same time, you know, we can ask their opinion. But if we have to send the tape to a producer, it's best if you're looking at the camera and not at the actor, which is just counterintuitive. Yeah. I hate it. I hate that there's not in-person auditions. I just hate it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, as things start opening yeah, back. I think they're gone forever. I really do. I really do. Okay. Yeah. I All hope right. I, I, I I hope so too, because I enjoy that. I, I want to, you know. Yeah. Be, I mean, you need to be directed a little bit. Actors are now having to direct themselves. Like that's. Yeah, that's never a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not a good thing. And they cast, a good casting director will, help you, uh, you know, uh, be better to in front of the producers for the callback. That's how it always was. It worked very well. And hopefully we'll get back there again, or they figure out a better way of doing that virtually than it is right now. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I want to spend some time talking about, but not in this uh, particular one, because I'm looking at how much time we spent already. So I would love to have you back to talk about your two other books and the other things that you're doing that I find okay. that. So uh, I'd love to have you back and just kind of uh, focus on those things because I think that's a show on its own that we should uh, dedicate some time. So anytime uh, you're free, I would love to uh, to schedule. Okay, okay great. Uh, and then last question, which uh, may be uh, more therapeutic uh, for me, but I know people may be asking it. So it's, it's uh, uh, I think it's on me to ask that question and ask it on camera as opposed to when we're done with the recording, is now seeing me after these uh, few months, do I still seem guarded? Do I seem more no, like- No, no, no. I was just marveling uh, when you started just how open you are. You're definitely not guarded Thank you. at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just seem a lot more relaxed and open and, uh, you know, it's more of a give and take uh, conversation. Good. Um, I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, thank you so much, Kathy. I really, truly uh, appreciate uh, what you have done and what role you've played in uh, my growth as an actor, as a person. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, and thank you for everybody who's, uh, who's tuning in. We appreciate it. Uh, please uh, check out uh, all of Kathy's information. We're going to have it linked. Check out her book. I'm going to link the other two books there as well. Uh, and uh, take a look, comment, uh, tell us what you think, and uh, let us know what uh, what kind of background you're using <laughs> to share. <laughs> Thank you again, everybody. Yeah.